We're back to talk more Gen U, and if you're here, then most likely you've seen part one of the Why You Need to Play Gen U video. There's an endless list of reasons why you should play Gen U, and I couldn't cover all of them if I tried, but I'm gonna try to at least hit the most important stuff. In the previous video, we talked about styles, hunter arts, and more. In this video, we're going to talk aesthetics, collaborations, hub and village separation, and of course, the 15th weapon. So sit back and relax, grab some food, some bistro tickets, and let's get into why you need to play Gen U. Since we all know that Gen U is a 3DS port, we obviously know that the graphics and the resolution are not going to be so high. The good news is that regardless of this being the case, the weapons and armor look absolutely fantastic. I know a lot of people's biggest complaint with Worldborn is the fact that some of the monster's weapon designs had slap-on bone or iron parts across them. Let me tell you one thing about Gen U. You won't find anything even near a slap-on design. There truly is something for everyone. If you're someone who's a fan of the more meme style weapons, Gen U has you covered and then some. This is a general consensus with Gen U. It's a lot more lighthearted and cartoonish than most of the other titles. You can see it applied in the number of wacky or funny weapon designs. One of the goofiest has to be the lance that's literally an entire shark and the shield is a no swimming sign. It's amazing because even the materials correspond perfectly to it. If you're not so much of a seafood fan, you can go ahead and use the giant ham hammer instead. We could honestly spend an entire video just talking about the cute and meme level weapon designs in this game because there's just that many. And I promise they're not all food related. Even the research weapons and weapons that require specific tickets look great. Not only that, but a lot of them are very much viable in the end game of Gen U. Take the research greatsword for example. It's actually top tier and rocks three slots. And it's not too bad to look at either. You'd be sadly mistaken though if you thought the meme weapons were the only ones that got some kind of effort and passion. I asked this question in my Discord, which if you aren't part of that yet, hit the link in the description below, what their favorite weapon tree was. I myself am pretty partial to the Malfestio, Nightcloak, or regular weapon trees. I love the elegant look of the weapons. They're not too outlandish, not too boring, but a perfect balance between beautiful and powerful. There were a lot of people who said the Magala lineups, and honestly, can you blame them? You'd be hard pressed to find a Magala weapon that I don't love. Don't get me wrong, there are some that I definitely like more than others, but they're all absolutely solid from top to bottom. One of the more underrated weapon design trees in my opinion would be the Sinister series of weapons. While there are only four weapons that get to be blessed with these designs, they absolutely crushed it with each one's design. This point of awesome designs definitely doesn't apply specifically to weaponry. The armor that you can craft is just as eye-catching, and this starts right from the get-go and low rank even. I remember crafting the Tetsukabra armor and being surprised at just how great it looked. And even though you have the split between the gunner and blade master armor, there's a silver lining in the fact that you can get more versions of an armor's aesthetic. Not only that, but there's plenty of variations of armor too to give it a little bit of a change to the look, and in some cases, the changes can be pretty drastic. You have the regular armor, the R versions, the G versions, the X versions, the XR versions, the possibilities are endless. One of the best things about Gen U is putting together a solid mix set. Now, one of the funniest things is, when you go through all of that work to make an awesome mix set, you exit out of the screen and then your hunter looks like this. It's almost like it's a rite of passage. Everyone has to experience that first ugly mix set to truly say they've experienced the old world. And it's very much true in the opposite sense. When you throw a mix set together and it actually looks halfway decent, it's a pretty solid feeling. Thankfully, there's a layered armor system for most of the mix sets that are pretty rough. Even though this isn't the newest Monster Hunter title, it's still Monster Hunter nonetheless. Fashion hunting is one of the real endgame routes here. Something that you may not be used to if you've only played Worldborn is the separation of village or solo quest and hub or multiplayer quest. In titles like Gen U, you have the village quests that are scaled for solo play. You have key quests you have to do to further this progress. This is the same in hub quests except these quests are meant to be played with a party and are already scaled for multiplayer, whether you're in a group or you try to take it on solo. The biggest difference between the two is that solo quests only go to high rank, while hub goes all the way to G rank. Now, technically you can get G rank materials from a few advanced quests in the village, but there's only so many of those and they definitely don't cover all the monsters in the game. So with this in mind, if you're looking to get into the G rank scene and start building 
the most powerful stuff in the game, you're going to have to go online. Now, in saying that, G rank definitely is doable solo and offline, but it's not easy, especially if you're coming from Worldborn and how easy that was to solo through. That's not the case here. But if you're looking for some awesome hunters to play with, join our Discord at the link in the description and match with some of the best hunters you'll play with for sure. If you don't have a crew to play with, you can still join random hubs to progress. I can definitely say that I've had a really solid experience with random groups in Gen U. When you get to the end game content like Fatalis and such, it's going to be a hit or miss, but if you're coming from Worldborn, you know how that can be already. Something that is present in the latest title, but is much more prevalent in Gen U, are the collaborations. Not only is there way more collab content in Gen U, but in my opinion, the collaborations themselves are much better. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely love content, so I still appreciated the crossover content in Worldborn. It Except for the movie crossover stuff, that was just trash. I'm definitely an anime nerd, so having all these collabs with different anime and Gen U is a huge plus for me. You have all kinds of bases covered. You get special weapons or armor, sometimes both, that correspond with the game or anime involved in the collaboration. Having the transmog system in place really takes things to another level. The collabs range from Fairy Tail to Okami, Baki to Zelda, Yu-Gi-Oh to Star Fox, Mega Man to Metroid. Now, I have to honestly say that the list is pretty expansive. I'll link a video in the description that goes over all of the DLC collaborations. Now if you're going to take on these event quests, you gotta be prepared for a bit of a tougher experience than you're used to with regular hub quests. In some cases, the collab gear is actually really good. For example, the bow that you can get from the Zelda collab is extremely good and a fantastic status bow. Now, these event quests also have a nice little aspect that you can take advantage of. They're available from the get-go in the events tab, so if you're looking for a specific monster you may need, such as a G-rank Hyper Brachydeos, you have to unlock this through a chain of quests. Quest. Or you can go ahead and do the Drifters Isle of the Lost Soul event quest that's already ready to go. Not only do you get those Hyper Brachy Cortex that you need, you also get Codex to make a badass greatsword that actually has the look of a sleek longsword. There's so many benefits that stem from these collab quests, whether we're talking about awesome looking and sometimes very powerful gear, giving an inside track to some quests, or just being a fun challenge to take on. So I spoke literally for two seconds about this style in my last video because I did didn't feel too confident in talking about it. Since that video I've spent time becoming a master in the alchemy style, aka I read up on some guides, played alchemy for a few days, and studied the guide in the discord our very own Astolfo made. With that being said, I can absolutely see why people are so passionate about the style. I'm a hunting horn maid, so buffing the entire party is something I love doing. Insert alchemy style, and I can do that with literally any weapon that I want to. You definitely have weapons that work better than others. For me, alchemy with switch axe feels incredibly smooth. It simplifies the inputs of switch axe, but it doesn't take away any of the fun. It also has some pretty bomb hunter art, so it's a solid fit for getting your party's SP going. That's the main goal of alchemy style, creating powerful items and increasing your SP mode to give various potent benefits. These SP levels each have a benefit unlocked from entering the state. SP1 lets your hunter arts charge faster, SP2 gives you mega dash juice effects to your stamina and stops it from decreasing, SP3 gives you extended health recovery even beyond the red portion of your health, SP4 gives you a 1.05 multiplier to your part break damage. Each SP state also gives the benefits of the lower levels as well. The super simplified description would be to shake your alchemy barrel to create dope items. The more you shake that barrel, the more powerful of an SP mode you can go into, and you go into these modes by activating a hunter art you've given that SP designation to. There's just such a beautiful synergy in the style itself. You want a way to make those hunter arts charge faster? Pop an alchemy cheer or sharpen your weapon up with the alchemy whetstone. Feel like it's taking too long for your alchemy barrel to charge up, pop the alchemy booster and profit. Now, those are just a few of the items you can create with the alchemy barrel, but they're definitely some of the best ones. You even have the capability to create temporary earplugs that will save you from staggering to a monster roar. Of course, these break after one use, but you can do something pretty slick with another alchemy item you can create. If you're familiar with those god tier items called slick axes you can use to duplicate things like ore, bugs, and other gathering materials, then you'll know exactly what I'm getting at. You can actually create alchemy slick axes that work in similar fashion on other alchemy items that you've made. This makes it very handy to boost 
boost up your inventory count and maybe even share the wealth with your fellow hunters. And we're honestly just scratching the surface here. You can make items that turn you into a walking medic station, you can make barrel bombs, and even items that give you the Valhazak level of extended health recovery. And as an added benefit, you don't do the goofy flex animation when you use these items. You can't give out all of these items you make, but some of the more impactful ones you can, like the whetstones and immunizers. There's plenty of paths you can take to reach that vaunted SP level 4, but I know one of my favorite routes to take is working towards that alchemy booster, which you should definitely have up at all times, making a couple of whetstones, using one of the whetstones, and then saving the other for a slick axe. After you've gotten through these items, you'll be at SP3 and should be able to get to SP4 easily through the flow of the hunt making items as needed. I cannot state just how game changing it is to have someone using alchemy style in your party. Now, I obviously haven't gone over every aspect of the style, but if this hasn't at least even made you want to try out alchemy style, then it's clear you have no soul and I don't know what to tell you. If you've ever wanted to feel just how powerful hunting horn users feel through buffing the party, seriously, look no further. Now, alchemy style has some similarities with the final reason why you should play Gen Yu. So I have to apologize in advance because I won't be able to spend the necessary time that this reason deserves or we'd have an extremely long video. That and the fact that Gaijin has about five or six solid videos on all the different aspects of Prowlers and just how powerful and fun they can be. Now, I'm going to give you an overview and help to try and pique your interest in giving the 15th weapon in Gen Yu a try. Right off the bat, a good reason would be because at the time this video was made, Prowler is not going to be an option in Rise, so Gen Yu may be your only opportunity to experience this absolutely fantastic and in-depth weapon. When you get into using the Prowler, it's very easy to get overwhelmed by all of the different types of Prowlers, the support moves, the skills, and what you're going to name your little buddies. And if you're the type of person that kicks a person out of your hub because they're using Prowler, you're unbelievably lame. Now, diving into the Prowlers themselves, you have certain bias that would determine some of the innate moves and skills the Prowler will already have learned. Like I said, there's a lot of things you can do to min-max and get the absolute perfect Prowler you want, but I'll leave that to Gaijin's videos and link his channel below. If you've ever played Pokemon, think about the IV values, personality, and all of that. It's not quite that complicated, but it's a similar system when it comes to min-maxing your Prowler. As far as the different types go, we have the Protection Prowler which actually gives you a whole ass adept guard to throw into your repertoire. It boasts some great defense as well. Do not sleep on the Prowler's Guard either. The Protection Prowler's Guard is solid. Not only that, but it actually gives you a nice boost to your gauge that you use for your support moves. The Protection Prowler gets a solid move in the form of Taunt, where the monster will then focus on you. This can come in clutch when a monster has a teammate trapped in a small space, or if they're trying to combo someone. Next is the Assist Prowler, and admittedly, this is one of the ones that I'm a little less interested in. Now, that's not to say it's bad in any way whatsoever, but it just doesn't rock my boat. This thing is an absolute trap expert. It can be extremely useful for locking down the monster. Prowlers can spam traps as long as they have gauge to do so, and they actually have an unlimited amount of trank bombs, so if you need to capture a monster, assist prowlers are a great thing to have. They can also sit down these traps a lot faster than their other counterparts. Not only that, but they're a great option for a ranged cat. They get a solid boost from each of the boomerang attacks, and they even get a third, very powerful boomerang to toss out. Not only do they get that third toss, but they get an exclusive pitfall trap that will automatically poison a monster if you can get them to fall in. Moving on to what I would consider to be my favorite type, the Healing Prowler, you get exactly what is advertised. The Healing Prowler has a support move that gives an absolute ridiculous amount of health back, called the True Health Horn. This Prowler also has a bit of a neat mechanic that's almost like an automatic recital for you hunting horn users. If you keep yourself still while playing any of the health horns, a healing prowler will actually play again and heal for even more. Hell, they even get a palico skill called Horn Virtuoso that will speed up playtime. Seriously though, if you're an alchemy style or hunting horn player, you'll love this type of prowler. And don't think it's a slouch on damage either. Hook it up with Pierce and Big Boomerang and profit. Now, speaking of profiting off of boomerangs, we come to the gathering prowlers. These guys have the highest gauge building from ranged attacks, 
so they're fantastic boomerang options, and the damage they do is also the best in terms of ranged attacks. Even their passive gauge build in battle is tied for first. I mean, these guys really do better than most would expect, seeing as how they're gatherers. I'm not really good with using the Mega Boomerang, but it's almost a necessity with these guys because they build up their gauge so easily. If you're a Worldborn player, do you remember how you could equip your Palico with a Plunder Blade and enjoy the extra booty at the end of a hunt? Well, Gathering Prowlers actually have that skill innately, so if you're looking to grind out some materials, get your gauge up and start firing firing off some plunder blades. You'll not only get an extra material for yourself, but there will be a nice shiny red drop for fellow hunters to pick up. The Charisma Prowler is another one I really haven't taken into battle, so there's not too much for me to say on it. It's definitely an option for playing a balance between range and close up. But with the kind of lackluster gauge buildup across the board, I tend to stay away from this Prowler. Exploding onto the scene is the Bomber Prowler that can definitely be fun, but you just have to be careful when you're using it. Your bombs can definitely knock back teammates, and the radius can get pretty big with the Giga Bombs that you'll be dropping. You add that to the fact that monsters only have so much real estate, and you have the potential to really annoy some people online. With that being said, it's not a tough task to manage the area you have available with others. The Bomber Prowler even gets a pretty solid Adept Dodge that will see you roll away quickly if you need to get away, or you can use a melee attack and go right back at the monster. A neat little addition to that Adept Dodge is the fact that you drop a little bomb as the Adept Dodge procs. As you would imagine, blowing things up helps to boost your gauge the most. Damage-wise, you're looking at another solid balanced option. I prefer going ranged myself due to the fact that they're a little on the lower end when it comes to defense. Now, if you want to go Psycho Melee Cat, then look no further than the Beast Prowler. There really are just so many things to love about this one. You're definitely gonna wanna go with Melee and stay close though. Beast Prowlers can go into a literal beast mode and become something along the lines of the Jaw Titan. You'll get new melee attacks and a finishing move that will see you level up your state, much like a Spirit Round Slash, with Longsword users. This move can actually be directed before it goes off, so take full advantage of that. The first powered up state will see you gain Rock Steady, the second gives you a solid 15% affinity, and then reaching the third and final stage will toss you into SP mode, letting your gauge build faster. You can even let out a rousing roar to share these benefits with your fellow hunters. Another benefit in this final state is an additional attack that you can rip off after landing that finisher that has a lot of hits and does mounting damage and can actually be directed before it's unleashed. While you're in this state, you can do a quick back evade that actually has frames available to benefit from. Another benefit akin to the spirit slashes of Longsword, all of your beast mode attacks have Mind's Eye. Even when you're outside of beast mode, you really don't lose any of the basic stuff that other Prowlers can do. You have plenty of space to do what you want with this Prowler, because when you do go into beast mode, you lose the ability to throw boomerangs, so the pierce and big boomerang combo that is pretty prevalent through the other types doesn't really work here, so you can throw in other things like health horn, traps, or whatever your heart desires. I've been having a blast with the newest Prowler type for sure. There are so many different Prowlers, so many different ways you can build them, it's absolutely impossible not to call this the 15th weapon, and it's definitely going to be a weapon that I'll miss tremendously. But that's going to be it for this one. There are so many reasons for you to try Gen Yu, but I hope these couple videos at the very least made you appreciate Gen Yu for what it was, a game that pushed the boundaries of the Monster Hunter series and did it with flying colors. I can't put into words just how much I'll miss things like deviants, weapon styles, prowlers, and so much more. If you get the opportunity to try this game, JUST DO IT! And if you do end up picking up the game, feel free to join our Discord where there will be plenty of people that would love to help you. Links for that Discord and Patreon will be in the description below. If you liked the video, feel free to hit that like button and help me out. Comment down below what you think is the main reason or reasons someone should try out Gen Yu. I've had so many people telling me they tried out Gen Yu because of these videos or my streams, and I could not be happy to hear that this game is getting the attention and love that it deserves. Subscribe and hit the bell if you haven't already for more Monster Hunter, Gen U, and other gaming content. Streams, reviews, guides, and more. Have a good night, happy hunting, and I'll see you guys in the next video.